This week in disc golf, Nicholas Santala finalizes the offseason with his promotion announcement. Tatar's new sponsor has many in the community concerned. There's some actual disc golf played. Drew calls out a Twitter account and so much more. It's Swiss Cheese with the Disc Golf World, and you guys already know the one with all the holes in his game. You're watching This Week in Disc Golf, where we hit on all things disc golf from the past week, all in no more than 15 minutes or less. Thanks, everybody, for taking the time to watch, and especially the ones who have subscribed. If any of you are attending the Disc Golf Expo, make sure to be on the lookout for Jefferson, as he just started his drive there today. Antla's promotion is the final major announcement this offseason, as we are less than a month away from the start of the season. Let's get into this signing. This Mania announced this week not only have they signed the 22-year-old Finnish player and arguably the best current European player not named Simon to a four-year deal, a promotion to their Sky team, but also a new disc in the company's creator lineup. Man, you Vino fans overseas, don't blast me too hard in the comments. Yes, he is more popular, but I still think Nicholas's game has a slight edge. The announcement was the second multi-year contract from Discmania this offseason after Gannon Burr, signing the two best young talents this offseason after the departure of Eagle McMahon. The signing also seemed to confuse many, as less than a month ago, Nicholas in a post thanked Discmania for the six prior seasons and stated it was a time to turn a new page in my career. Many took that as a departure and anticipated a signing with a new team. Only to return to Discmania, which brings to question, was this an offseason ploy to further hype his announcement and most importantly promotion, or was he truly intending to leave only for Discmania to save the relationship at the last minute? With all that we have seen this offseason with rumors, departures, marketing, and trolling, nothing is too surprising at this point. Yet details of the little information that has come out on his contract might allude to more interesting story. As UC Discmania's founder alleges that this is the highest European contract deal to his knowledge. Where that lands him is not specific enough, but must be over 150000 to TARS making per year and might just total over a million dollars over that entire span. The fact that this contract is a four-year deal, and as high as it is, to some, does show that there must have been other interests from another or multiple companies in acquiring Nicholas, forcing the bidding price to possibly go up in his favor. The young player has opened many fans' eyes on some of the biggest stages of disc golf, whether it was his battle with Gannon at 2022's USDGC or his past Champions Cup where he took second yet again at another major. He's won nearly everything possible in Europe and, again, is 22 years young. Yet he has not broken through for a victory here in the U.S. Getting that large of a contract prior to a signature victory has not been seen in disc golf past. Certainly more difficult than this current market we find ourselves, where some tour winners are only seeing one-year deals. Add that he is currently the highest rated European player on the market this offseason, a market that many companies are looking to get larger presence in, especially with the newly added and unified European tour, it's no surprise most major companies and smaller ones like Clash or Latitude 64 would not be interested. Or Discmania after the departure of Eagle further put the importance of locking in Antela, so much so and with his potential locked him up for a multi-year deal. Like most news, it will stay in disc golf circles where things are often shared among each other, just not to the public. Yet this move was needed by Discmania to maintain themselves near the top of the disc golf hierarchy, and certainly after the departures of both Crush Boys within two past off seasons. They might have the best young core of talent signed through the next three seasons, solidifying your team with major winners Gannon Burr and Kyle Klein, and now adding Antela was the best possible outcome from losing the likes of Eagle and Simon. In some other news coming from Europe, Kristen Tatar announced a new sponsor in PATH in her latest post. The sponsorship did have fans talking, and it wasn't just the fact the man photographed looks like a villain John McClain battles atop a skyscraper. PATH is an overseas gambling company that is one of the first to enter into disc golf player sponsorship. Though no one is upset about outside money coming into the sport, especially on the player side, as most would say they welcome any additional money for the players. Many in the community are questioning whether a gambling casino entering the sport is a good look especially with the views of it being a vice or profiting off addiction and even more unwarranted concerns of damaging the game itself. Few looked into the fact that Tatar's sponsorship is in part due to PAFs and the Auland municipality that owns it commitment to donate large portion of profits to support sports, culture, and the social sector. Slightly different than your typical better site we all see here in the States. A major company overseas sponsoring the most known, celebrated, and accomplished athletes in Estonia, and the fact that she is a disc golf professional, should be heralded as a victory for the sport, especially in the growth of the game in Europe. It also shows how bright Tatar's star shines in her homeland. Disc golf still being young in Europe and its main player now being female, with sponsorship deals from major businesses, will possibly help this sport grow overseas unlike here in the States. 
Certainly, the promotion of Tatar has to help in participation of the sport across age and gender, unlike what the sport has ever truly seen in its history over here. Disc golf has been disproportionately steered on the MPO side of the sport through early coverage and player sponsorship deals. However, what Tatar has been able to accomplish in Estonia and Europe could help the promotion of the sport on a more level field, which just might be the early stages of this sport in Europe growing more mainstream than what we may ever encounter here at home. Add the unification of the new European tour and the current landscape of the sport seems to be on the cusp of great things. Also, as the sport grows in general and hopefully to the heights we all wish, other vice products and sponsorships will certainly be entering the sport. And these conversations will continue to be ongoing discussions with every new sponsor, especially as the sport continues to grow in participation. Shoot, there was outrage, albeit faint, of Bushnell entering the sport, as they are owned by Vista Outdoor, who was being boycotted by REI and other companies for their stance on the NRA. It's understood that gambling is a larger moral topic for people to have more convictions on. But for a sport desperate for money, especially on the FPO side, might be a necessary evil to grow the game. I'm already kind of surprised we haven't seen a KJ sponsored by Seltzer Company already. Seems too perfect of a fit. This week also saw some actual disc golf being played as the unofficial start of the disc golf season began with the Shelly Sharp Memorial held at Vista in Scottsdale, Arizona. The tournament saw the return of Drew Gibson, who was out most of the year last season due to an elbow injury. Say what you will about the course and the fact it's all hyzer, it is good to actually see some disc golf being played. And the only reason it is played is due to Terry Miller's efforts to record the event. Drew would have a share of the lead with Anthony Barella after day one, but had a disastrous day two with a one over knocking him out of contention for the victory. He did put together the hot round 11 under on the final day for a podium finish for his first tournament back. AB looked like he was going to run away with this thing as he improved his day one score by a single stroke for a 10 under on day two. He gave him a four stroke lead over Parker Welk heading into the final day. Only for Parker to put together a 1070 rated 10 under with 11 birdies final round that eventually pushed a playoff with Barella after he shot a mediocre six under for the day. Parker took down the event, his first victory with the just recently signed DGA. Over in the FPO, of course, Tour Warrior Owen Scoggins was in attendance and led the event from start to finish. This time of year, and specifically the Asia Open, is the date that all who hate PDGA ratings mark on their calendar, as it continues to be the main example for them to highlight to eliminate or improve the rating system. Yet another Manabu Kajiyama victory and Jackie Chen throwing 18 under on day one, only to follow it up with a 17 under the next day, had these curmudgeons more twisted in their emotions than a Lions fan during a playoff. These people like to highlight that these players ratings are inflated due only to this event and they're not near their american counterparts erasing the fact that pros have highlighted the skills of these two players and only have a handful of results in the states to prove their example not a battle i care to have just funny the vitriol this event brings there has been few other player movements and some more off-season disc golf news Paul Macbeth is actually throwing, he hints of some compact form tweaks, and goes on to say his putt is in mid-season form. Questions on Paul's season have been speculative since his injury announcement. However, if his health and putt is truly on, it should be able to put together some solid showings this season. Jacob Cupcake Curtis announced he'll no longer be sponsored by Clash, says he'll be announcing in the near future. However, if it's anything like his putt, we could be looking at a week or more. Andrew Marweed had to DNF for the first time of his career at the Shelby Sharp Memorial due to back pain. Emerson Keith picked up a B-tier win with his new sponsor, Innova. Gavin Rathbun, with a mixed bag, took down the Martin County Open. Here's your public service announcement. UDISC yearly subscriptions go up to $30 on March 18th. Now, for some social media quick hitters. Drew Gibson went on a rant on Tuesday targeting specifically the parody Ken Climo account, who had been using Drew as common fodder on the X site. That, and it wasn't the only time the account has been called out by pros, as Brody and the GOAT himself to squash the account, yet they still persist. For many, the post only validated what they wanted. Those who agreed with Drew further chanted the eventual demise of the Twitter handle. And for those who supported the parody account, only validated Drew sleeps in only an oversized shirt. Casey White hit an Oliver Tree concert. And listen, the fact that I've been able to witness the popularity of a mashup of Janko jeans I once wore in middle school, the killer sound, and meme culture as peak aesthetics might be the true fall of civilization. Casey's friends also did their best to remind Casey not to be like Oliver Tree before he leaves for tour. That cake certainly looks more appealing than Eagle's iced rice cakes he calls gyro cookies. Those cookies look dry as F, but still not as bad as him continually using MV peeps. Adam Hammes not only sent off his Brixton card to get graded, including his Iron Leaf 1 of 1, but also headed to Arizona in preparation of the season kicking off. 
Speaking of which, Brixton announced an extension with the DGBT for future releases. Cynthia Riccati and Kyle Klein swim with the Dolphins. Every couple photo of these two, Kyle gives me Golden Retriever vibes. Maybe just me. Kat shows off her pink vacuum and explains she's hitting her pink phase. Can't wait for those Hello Kitty sundresses on tour. Baseball Hall of Famer and Minnesota legend Joe Maurer sponsored a hole eight at the Airborne Preserve Black Bear Course. Ella Hansen goes boogie boarding, has this mind scrambling sentence attached. Foundations Grip Block and Tour Life have a fake clickbait beef to stir likes and merch sales. Real question is who deceived their fan bases worse with fake offseason speculation despite knowing true player landing spots ahead? And that wraps up another twig. If you stayed this long and you aren't subscribed, make sure to do so. While you're at it, like, comment, and share. And if you want more, make sure to peek all the previous episodes and everything that we're doing continually. 